Welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon from um, what looks like a very cloudy day in Singapore. And if you are calling in or zooming in from elsewhere around the world, or maybe even watching this after the event is over on YouTube, um, good day to all of you. I'm very happy to be the uh, moderator today. My name is Tat Lim. Uh, I'm a practitioner uh, in Singapore. And the topic that uh, we will be spending the next hour together uh, discussing with our panel of experts uh, is entitled Mediation and Arbitration Dispute Resolution in the New Normal. Uh, this certainly would be a very interesting topic given what's been happening in the last two years, um, the, the notion of what used to be before COVID struck us um, seems like a distant past, but hopefully for most of us, we are now looking at COVID as something like the beginning of the end uh, and maybe thinking of um, what next uh, beyond um, all the things that we've experienced in the in the last two years and so it's in these uh, times and the theme that we have that we are looking at how businesses um, in, re in the region that we operate are looking for alternative dispute resolution services in the case of conflict and what that means is how would you consider resolving conflicts outside of the courts? What sort of alternative dispute resolution methods can you choose? Um, immediately what comes to mind uh, are the methods and modes of uh, dispute resolution like mediation and arbitration. And these are processes which both uh, our members from the panel will be elaborating and speaking about um, in the course of today. Uh, but before we get to that point and hear from our expert, um, it is my distinct honour and pleasure uh, to introduce our guest of honour, His Excellency Fabrice Villiers, Ambassador at the Embassy of Switzerland, to deliver to us his opening remarks. So I hand this floor over to His Excellency. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me just get access to my notes and I'll be right with you. Okay. Okay, so uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, uh, dear Swiss uh, CHAM members, dear fellow lawyers and arbitrators, a uh, warm welcome to this new webinar on dispute resolution in the new normal. This is the first time that's that uh, Swiss CHAM is organizing uh, such a webinar about this legal uh, topic, and this is uh, most uh, welcomed. The focus today will be on the legal instruments of dispute resolution, such as arbitration and mediation. Uh, let me say a few words uh, in this regard. So Switzerland has, uh, as uh, you know, has a long-standing tradition of international arbitration. As a country, if you aggregate uh, Geneva and Zurich, for example, it regularly ranks into the top three or top five uh, places of arbitration in the world uh, with regard to the number of cases awarded. Uh, it is also among the most popular places for the choice of law. Uh, finally, it has built over time a very large pool of reputable and renowned arbitrators uh, regularly appointed or confirmed. Uh, what are the general reasons for that? Uh, well, Switzerland offers political stability, strong rule of law, as well as neutrality. The country's location in the center of uh, Europe is also convenient and offers excellent infrastructure. It has linguistic diversity. Uh, and historically, Swiss arbitration dates back, uh, if you uh, want to refer to a case, to the Alabama case between the United Kingdom and the United States of America, uh, where the dispute uh, over the UK providing safe harbors to the Confederate raider Alabama during the War of Secession. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, we can say that uh, the legal framework offers um, friendly uh, arbitration environment. Uh, it is important to note that uh, these characteristics are not uh, only specific uh, to Switzerland, but that Singapore shares uh, some of these <coughs> strengths or some of these qualities. 
Singapore is also and has become over time the preferred seat of, for arbitration in Asia and one of the most preferred seats also uh, worldwide. Uh, together with the creation of the Singapore International Arbitration Center, <clears throat> uh, Singapore has really become a uh, well, major uh, <clears throat> arbitral uh, country um, in, the, um, in the recent years. Uh, mostly for similar reasons as for Switzerland, stability, location, diversity, arbitration friendly environment, and also a very supportive government uh, pushing for Singapore to compete with the most popular arbitration uh, seats in the world. Now, one word on mediation, uh, which is something new and uh, where uh, Singapore uh, contributed uh, to, uh, to uh, develop uh, this uh, sort of a new international framework uh, for mediation. In 2018, uh, the UN Commission on International Trade Law, uh, UNCTRAL, adopted the Convention on the Recognition of International Mediation Agreements. Long title, but short title, it's like Singapore Convention on Mediation. So Singapore was very instrumental uh, in the conduct of the negotiations, uh, but also offered uh, Singapore as a place for signing uh, the instrument and this uh, signing ceremony was held, luckily, in 2019, in August, uh, before all the COVID uh, restrictions uh, came. Uh, and um, and it's, um, it entered into force. Um, okay, well, maybe first 55 uh, states uh, have signed the convention. Uh, quite a few uh, important notable countries like USA, China, India, South Korea, uh, Turkey, uh, lots of uh, small and medium-sized countries. Uh, some uh, may have noticed that uh, European countries have not yet signed uh, as Switzerland. Switzerland was present at the signing ceremony, but was not a signatory. Um, it's probably, uh, to, well, and to today the convention entered into force first in September 2020, uh, between Singapore, Fiji, and Qatar. Uh, and today it's in force and will be in force in June among nine countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, Belarus, Ecuador, Honduras, Turkey, and Georgia uh, ratified. So the conventions offers for sure uh, new, uh, new ways uh, and certain advantages, um, probably also uh, new venues, inexpensive, maybe quicker uh, to resolve dispute settlements and uh, maybe uh, uh, growing and may become an international, well, may become a very uh, but useful uh, instrument uh, to complement uh, dispute resolution uh, in uh, commercial uh, cases. So I will not go into the details uh, on the mediation convention, you probably wonder, European Switzerland, why we are not on board yet. Uh, I don't have the answer for the Europeans. I have few elements uh, that I can share with you uh, with regard uh, to uh, Switzerland. Um, <clears throat> so in, in Switzerland, we traditionally, uh, when it gets to ratifying new instruments, especially uh, in civil and commercial law, uh, we take our time to observe the development of the convention. Uh, we also uh, integrate the new elements in our national law. And we still have uh, quite a few questions uh, to be clarified under Swiss law uh, in order uh, to be able to launch um, a consultation on a possible uh, signature uh, of the convention. Um, it's, uh, it may take uh, a certain time, uh, work is uh, put on it uh, with a wide, con wide consultation with the lawyers, uh, with the academics, etc. Uh, and so the, the will, the maybe, the maybe over time uh, possibility uh, for Susan to sign. But at this stage, as I said, uh, we are more like uh, observing the development of the new instrument. Uh, its relevance, as I said before, we have nine parties, it's ratified among nine parties, so its relevance, 
probably also ratification among uh, European states, our main uh, Switzerland's main trading partners uh, would also uh, play a role in our uh, final assessment. But that being said, you know, we recognize uh, that this new instrument, instrument has uh, a great interest and great pot potential uh, for the future. So I will give you back the floor uh, after these few introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to introduce um, the first of our two panelists. I'd like to introduce Dr. Beatrice Herman. Beatrice uh, holds a doctoral degree in business administration from the University of Bern, Switzerland. She's an accredited associate mediator of the Singapore Mediation Centre with additional appointment to the SMC's family panel of mediators. She's also an accredited member of the Swiss Umbrella Organisation of Medi Mediation and the Swiss Chamber of Commercial Mediation. She's also a certified executive coach. Beatrice has been working in the business consulting industry for over 20 years with her own companies, uh, both in Singapore and Switzerland. Uh, during many mediations and coaching sessions, Beatrice has worked with a diverse group of individual clients, helping them to develop further. She's also given workshops, webinars on internal conflict management and respective leadership development options. She speaks English and German fluently, able to communicate in French and Spanish, understands and speaks some Italian and Mandarin. That's a, a whole lot of languages uh, and I can barely just hold one and a half. <laughs> um, on that note, um, Beatrice, my pleasure. Let me hand the floor over to you. Beatrice will touch on and speak about um, mediation. Thanks, Dad. Um, I wouldn't want to have the conversation on um, uh, in Mandarin just now, but uh, thanks for the introduction as well. I hope you can all see my screen, my first slide now uh, on mediation. Let me maybe start with uh, an important remark. I really want to explain to you what mediation is. And one important thing is also, it's not necessarily a legal um, procedure. It's really a method of alternative disp dispute resolution. So the important thing is I'm not a lawyer. I studied law as a minor at university, but it doesn't um, necessarily help me that much for mediation. So people can do mediation not in a legal context and they can really also do mediation and be excellent mediators without the legal background. So having said that, let me just um, tell you a little bit about what I want to talk about. I really want to explain this, um, as the ambassador said, relatively new procedure. Also, it is really culturally very ingrained in Singapore and in Switzerland. So the method for that has been around for a very long time. Um, I will then quickly talk about one of my favorite topics, the iceberg. We will then uh, look into when does it make sense to mediate with um, who is a great uh, party to be successful in mediation as well in that sense. Why would people not mediate? Also an important aspect, especially um, in a context where mediation is not mandated by the courts. And um, we will also look into how to overcome certain aspects of this hesitation why people are not, let me say, daring to go for mediation as a dispute resolution method. Um, I don't want to talk about this slide very long, but uh, in the context of uh, sharing about mediation and arbitration, it shows a bit where on the continuum we are with mediation. We can, if you have a conflict, a dispute, we can do nothing, right? We just um, let it pass. We, we don't talk to each other and hope the conflict goes away. We then move into um, position-based negotiation, meaning I say I want this, you say I want that, before we realize we might need help to solve our conflict. And this is exactly where mediation can come in. So the higher up we move in the in the ladder in that uh, sense, the more costly it can become and the less control you personally as a party 
have about the outcome because you have external parties being in a conciliation, in an arbitration, or even in a court setting from a judge that takes decisions for you. So one important thing about mediation is that you are still the one driving the process in the discussion with the other party, and you make your case in that sense, but you also drive the decision. You are solely responsible for the outcome. It's not imposed by anyone externally. I'll give you a definition of mediation. It's really um, a voluntary attempt to resolve a dispute with the help of a neutral third party. The two things to stress here is voluntary. So no one forces you into mediation. You are um, free to do a mediation. You are free to continue a mediation. And you are also free to conclude the mediation with the settlement. At the same time, being free means that you can still go on, you can take it to an arbitrate, you can take it to court if you don't find a resolution. So it's really voluntary. You have a third party involved. This is also important because this is going to be your mediator, a neutral person that helps both sides and the person is supposed to be neutral and not take any sides that helps you discuss the topics of the conflict. And we will see that later also the underlying interests and what this whole dispute is really about. So you don't uh, stay on a level, I'm right, you're wrong, but you really try to find together with the mediator a solution. So what is mediation really? And I said that before, it's a process, it's a guided process. And the main role of the mediator in this whole process is to guide you through this process, to help you go through all the, um, the little steps in this process and get ahead in your dispute resolution. So the mediator is really an independent person that facilitates. We have different schools here, I'll, I'll just admit to that. I mean, there are people that take mediation more into a advice-seeking process as well. But from my perspective, it's really a, um, a facilitative process. And also important here, the mediator is not your decision maker. So the person is not going to say in the end, you are right, you are wrong. So, but they are really going to be the ones helping you to find a mutual agreeable solution. What I put in bold here is the parties stay in the driving seat. So it's really about the parties. And we are looking at not just the, um, the, the positions saying, I want this, you want that, but we are digging deeper, which does not mean that we go into an emotional process or it's a, it's a soft process, not at all. But we really facilitate a win-win solution in the end. So we take care that both sides find a best way out of that conflict as a mediator. What's also very important is that mediation can really help to solve business relationship. Uh, imagine you are in a setting in COVID or not, where you have a lot of disputes with long ongoing um, business parties. You don't necessarily want to go to court or to the arbitrator and, and um, get your win out of it, but you really want to continue the business relationship even beyond this uh, conflict. Mediation helps you to do that. Um, as we heard before, it's often uh, faster, it's often cheaper than a court proceeding or even an arbitration. Um, sometimes these end up in settlements as well, but we have, as uh, in mediation, we have a very high success rate. So we are at 70 to 80% success rates. And that's very, um, it's true across the world. It's the same in Singapore, it's the same in Switzerland. So we all go along these lines. So now quickly talking about the tip of the iceberg, what this means is that in mediation, you really go beyond what is on the surface. You really look at the interests and needs of people and you try to find the solution for that. Um, an example to make that a bit clearer is the typical orange example. You might have heard that before. Two people are fighting about an orange. Both want the orange. So in the end, they decide, OK, let's just cut this orange in half. It's not so difficult. So one person takes um, their half of the orange, peels it, eats the flesh and throws the skin away. The other person peels it as well, but throws the flesh away and in the end makes a cake out of the peel of the orange. 
So had they gone for a mediation or really talked about what they wanted, eating the orange or making a cake out of the peel, they both would have gotten more. They both would have gotten the whole orange for their purpose in the end. So it's really about enlarging, enhancing the cake and not just splitting it in half or finding the right or wrong answer. This is um, a common example, and it really illustrates what we mean with going into the interests and the wishes. When does it make sense to mediate? Really, it almost always makes sense to mediate before you um, go for a court fight, let me put it that way. Um, you can use it for any types of disputes. You can use it in family disputes, which is culturally quite ingrained in Switzerland. You can also use it for commercial uh, disputes for big companies, small companies, you often don't have the resources if you are a small company and you don't have an in-house counsel. So you can really try to solve your conflicts um, through mediation. What is also beauty of mediation is that you can include non-legal topics like relationships uh, in your outcome. So your settlement, it's a contract, right? You can use anything in there. So even things that are not legally, um, uh, cannot be written down in that sense, you can include in your mediation agreement. Um, as I said before, ongoing business relationships, but you can also use it again in a, in a newer context, maybe if you have delays due to COVID for one-off um, disputes. So you can really use it anywhere in the end. Um, why would people not mediate? They don't understand the process often. I get it so often that they say, mediation, do I need a yoga mat for that? Oh, it's very soft. Um, what are you talking about? So people don't know about the process yet, especially in a Swiss context. I know in Singapore, it's much more known. Therefore, they feel uncomfortable. What's my role in this? I'm a manager. What am I supposed to do now? They are uncomfortable in their role as a legal advisor as well, because they don't don't know what is going on and they also feel like they are losing power and control of the whole process. Then sometimes they're just so um, into their conflict, right? They're, they just want to end it. They want to take it to court. They don't believe in an amicable solution any longer. And they also feel it's a risk now to go for mediation, to try another time. But again, a mediator can really help to improve your chances to solve the conflict without um, going the legal way. Then obviously there are some commercial benefits. I have these discussions quite a bit on the legal side as well as an external advisor, as an in-house counsel. Sometimes you are hesitant to even give mediation a chance because A, it seems a bit soft and B, there might be a loss of revenue and business on that side as well. And yes, there are concerns about confidentiality and concerns about missing deadlines, but all these can be resolved with the right process steps as well. So how to overcome that? And I'd be very quick because I'm running out of time already. Um, in terms of confidentiality, the great way is to um, use shuttle mediation, which means the mediator speaks to one party at a time and doesn't have them necessarily in the same room, at least not all the time. But it can also help yourself for your case to prepare your case to take it further if you understand your interests better, if you understand the other party's interests uh, a bit better as well. So there is not necessarily a downside to um, admitting a few things or, or talking about certain aspects. And, and I'm sure Julie is going to uh, talk a bit more, if not, we are going to talk about that in the panel discussion, is also the mediation clauses you can put in your contracts already. You can also have um, an ARB, med ARB agreement in the procedures. So these are all ways for confidentiality to um, make sure you don't miss any timelines in the process as well. So this really is a very brief overview on what mediation is and can do. I included a slide here, but I'm not going to talk about it, where we stand in Singapore and in Switzerland, what organizations you have to. So if you have a conflict where you can go and you have some institutions, you have some organizations that help you with finding mediators and really solving your conflict with mediation. But you will get the slides later on and you can um, come back to quest with questions to me as well. So that was a lot of information, Pat, I'm uh, handing back to you to go forward with the webinar.
Thank you so much, Beatrice. Um, a lot of useful information and uh, uh, for, for all participants, um, anytime you have any questions or you have any comments, please feel free to put them in the chat group. Um, later on, when we, are, when we go into our panel discussion, we will pick up all the questions that's raised uh, and the panel members will answer any questions or comments that you may have. Uh, right now, um, it's uh, again back to me and my, my pleasure to introduce uh, our next uh, panel member, um, uh, Ms. Julie Raneda. She is a partner in Schellenberg uh, Whitmer's International Arbitration Practice in Singapore. She represents clients in international, commercial and investor state arbitrations. Julie has been involved as counsel in complex arbitration seated in civil and common law jurisdictions and also acts as an arbitrator. Her main areas of expertise include construction and engineering, energy, pharmaceutical, life sciences, manufacturing and international sales. She completed degrees in um, international relations at the Graduate Institute Geneva uh, and also has a law degree from the University of Geneva. Julie was admitted to the Swiss Bar in 2011 to the Singapore Bar in 2016 as a foreign lawyer. She is also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Julie is the chair of the Swiss Arbitration Association, Southeast Asia Chapter and the co-chair of the IPBA Next Generation Committee. She is IAJA's national representative in Singapore and a co-founder of the Women's Business Society established in Geneva in 2012. Uh, Julie will talk uh, about um, arbitration and her perspective on what that looks like in the, um, the new normal. Um, over to you, Julie. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tat, and many thanks to the Swiss Tram for the kind invitation and for organizing this uh, webinar. Let me share my slides. So I'm going to speak about uh, arbitration, which is a well-known and actually one of the most preferred uh, dispute resolution methods for international commercial disputes. Uh, so what is arbitration? Arbitration is an alternative dispute resolution mechanism to typical court litigation, and it is characterized by a few key features. First, it is a consensual process and really consent is the, the core principle at the heart of arbitration. So it means that arbitration only applies when parties mutually agree to arbitrating the dispute. So typically the ab ab agreement would be uh, recorded uh, in a clause in the contract, uh, which we call the arbitration agreement. Uh, second feature, arbitration results in a binding decision on the dispute, uh, what we call an arbitral award, uh, and its binding force is similar to a state court judgment. I think this is one of the important difference with uh, mediation. Third, arbitration allows the parties to choose their own arbitrators, unlike in state courts uh, where you don't choose your charges. But it even goes you know, beyond the choice of arbitrator. You can actually choose your institution, the uh, uh, arbitration rules you're gonna use. You choose obviously the seat of arbitration, the law governing generic. So there is great freedom for the parties and I'll come back uh, to that point. So how does these key features uh, translate into practical advantages? So I have listed here the most you know, common uh, advantages listed by the users of arbitration and our clients. And I think the first one is efficiency, uh, unlike in court proceedings. The, the parties and the arbitrators are free to shape uh, the procedure of an arbitration with a high degree of flexibility and really to, to frame and tailor that proceeding to the specific uh, needs of a dispute. Uh, and this, if done properly, can save substantial time and cost in the proceeding. Second, arbitration can be expedited. And there are various uh, procedural mechanisms that are available, such as the early dismissal uh, of claims, expedited procedure for you know, lower value claim, which means that the, the whole proceedings must be completed within six months, including you know, 
uh, the insurance of the award. You have emergency arbitrator uh, procedure for urgent interim relief. So there are mechanisms that exist that allow for expedite and fast proceedings when it is suited for a given case. Uh, third, and I mentioned that already, the choice of arbitrator. And I think that's one of the most important feature of arbitration because you know you can really choose the right uh, people to decide your disputes. You're gonna choose an arbitrator who uh, you know, has the right skills, the right qualification, the, the industry knowledge, the experience, the right language skills. And I think very importantly, especially for international disputes, you know, an understanding of the cultural aspects. Um, so uh, it's, it's actually a very important element. Fourth, confidentiality. Arbitration can be confidential, so you can keep all aspects of, of the arbitration confidential and the existence of the arbitration, uh, as well as, as the final award. Last but not least, uh, you know, arbitration is readily enforceable worldwide, and that's thanks to the New York Convention uh, on the uh, recognition and enforceability of international uh, awards. Uh, that convention has been ratified by um, 169 countries. So that's basically the whole world. And your award is basically considered as a state court judgment in any you know, courts around the world and can allow you to attach a seized assets worldwide. So uh, Singapore and Switzerland are you know, top places for international arbitration. Uh, Ambassador Filiers uh, said already a few words about this. I'm gonna be brief. Uh, an important, uh, I mean, recognition, Singapore has been named the most preferred place of arbitration in the world together with London in the 2021 Queen Mary and White MK survey, which is a really an incredible and most deserved recognition uh, for Singapore. And uh, I mean, it's been ranked as the preferred seat in Asia for, for many years now, but it's also a seat chosen worldwide for international arbitration. Switzerland, as Ambassador Filius mentioned, is, you know, has this long standing tradition of arbitration and uh, Geneva Zurich as, uh, are both uh, well known places for international arbitration. Um, so why are those two jurisdictions so popular for international arbitration? I think Singapore and Switzerland both have a very straightforward and easy legal framework for arbitration that both for domestic and international arbitration. They have uh, courts, state courts that are very supportive of arbitration. And especially for Singapore, the government has invested heavily to, to achieve its goal of making Singapore an international arbitration hub, but beyond that, an international dispute resolution hub, uh, uh, which has been a very, very successful endeavor. Uh, Singapore has a highly sophisticated uh, arbitral institution, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, and also highly sophisticated facilities with max 12 chambers, so really first-class uh, facilities for to conduct the arbitration. Switzerland, uh, you know, already um, it's a, a very pro-arbitration country with a long-standing tradition. Uh, I think one important key feature is when you have an international award in Switzerland, it's basically a final award because you have only one level of review of that award and that's before the Swiss Supreme Court. And uh, the, the grants to challenge an, uh, an arbitral award in Switzerland are very limited. So the success rate to challenge an arbitral award in Switzerland is less than 7%. So it's a, it's a big advantage of arbitrating in Switzerland. Swiss law is a very uh, um, is very frequently chosen for international contracts. It's the third most preferred law uh, after English and U.S. law. It's because it's really business friendly. It gives great contractual freedom to the parties, and it's available in several langu languages, including English. Uh, Swiss arbitrators have are very experienced in arbitration. Uh, and they are really uh, nominated in the most high profile disputes around the world. Um, so that's also make the success of Switzerland for uh, arbitration. And I think one feature of Swiss arbitration, which is very interesting, 
this settlement facilitate, facilitation procedure. And that's something that is very unusual for Singaporeans, uh, I must uh, recognize, but it's uh, highly effective. Basically, uh, the arbitrator with the consent of the party propose a settlement facilitation hearing after the first exchange of uh, written submissions. Uh, and during that hearing, they gave their preliminary views on the case. They, they set out the strengths and weaknesses in their views and at this stage on the case and uh, with the consent of the party can act as settlement facilitators. And this is highly effective. I've done it uh, a couple of times and uh, with success. Um, one word on the arbitration agreement, uh, because it's uh, very, very essential that it is drafted in simple and clear terms. Otherwise, it leads to disputes uh, over uh, the terms of the clause, and that's a dispute within the dispute. And that's exactly what you want to avoid. So what we usually advise our clients to do is really to take the model clause uh, proposed by uh, several institutions. So here I've put up the, the model clause uh, of SISE of SIAC. Uh, you see there are very key elements that you have to have in your clause, which are uh, you know, the, the, the arbitration rule, the seat of the arbitration, the number of arbitration and the language. And that's basically it. You don't need anything else. And we really advise you to, to keep it to that. Last word, and I'll be brief, is on uh, third party funding, because I think that's something that is not so well known, especially uh, in, in Singapore. And it's something that can address one of the recurring criticisms that we hear about arbitration, which is its cost, because admittedly, it can be expensive and, and sometimes it can even be a barrier to bringing a well-funded claim uh, for compensation. Um, so what is third party funding? It's a, a, a third party, so unrelated to the dispute that will fund uh, the, the legal proceedings. That means the arbitrator's fee, the institution fees, but also the legal fees, I mean, the lawyer's fees. Uh, in, in exchange of a share of the damage awarded or a share of the settlement sum. Um, that's uh, really help to take the, the financial issue of arbitration completely out of the picture. And it's a great tool that we recommend to always consider at the outside of, of, a, of an arbitration. It's been uh, permitted in Switzerland for decades. Uh, it's been most recently introduced in, in Singapore in 2017. Uh, and it's a great, great tool to keep in mind. So I'll stop here and I'm available for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Ted. Thank you, Julie. I was very intrigued um, uh, with what you have just said, especially when you were talking about the settlement facilitation procedures, something that uh, I think is not um, uh, well, entrenched in the way that uh, we carry out uh, our processes, but it does sound like um, something which uh, should be seriously considered here for the purpose of saving costs. Sounds also like a kind of informal neutral evaluation um, to allow parties to take stock before you roll out the full process of the arbitration. Um, very fascinating. Um, so uh, again, once uh, a shout out to participants, if you have any questions um, or comments, uh, please feel free to raise it in the chat group. and. Uh, we'll be sure to engage you in the discussion. Right now, um, what uh, we're going to do is to invite both Beatrice and Julie into a panel, uh, and we are going to discuss some of the themes that arises from their presentations, and also from the, the theme of today's topic, which is uh, uh, when we look at both mediation and arbitration uh, in the light of the new normal. So let me get started first by putting forward a question and then I'll ask uh, both panel members to comment from their perspective. So the theme for today's webinar, as we know, is about dispute resolution in the new normal. Uh, how do you see this new normal being different from the old normal? Uh, and maybe sort of speak about your perspective on what are the, some of the changes that you've seen as a practitioner in the dispute resolution practice? Uh, in the evolution from the old to the new. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start by asking Beatrice to comment on this and then after that, Julie. 
Okay, sure. Thanks for that. Um, what I realize is that conflicts have become a lot more personal in a way. So you have a lot of emotions involved due to the pandemic, due to um, conflicts that come out of the pandemic. And I really feel that's a big share that we are dealing with these days. Um, also, we have new conflicts, right? We have new conflict areas at home. We have new conflict areas at work that might have not existed the same way before we had this new um, situation. So I would say, yes, it has shifted a bit in terms of what kind of conflicts and also the emotional um, involvement of people there. Mm. Julie, um, your thoughts in relation to how that affects or impacts on uh, arbitration as a dispute resolution process? I think I agree with Beatrice. Uh, we've seen a, a new branch of uh, disputes uh, with COVID, uh, issue of force measure, um, you know, uh, supply so shortage, lots of, you know, Constru suspension of construction, and uh, so a whole new new range of, of disputes have arisen with COVID. We have changed our, our way of living, uh, the way we handle disputes. Uh, we have embraced technology uh, in a way that we would have never expected, and I think that's a part of the welcome change, and we may want to, to speak about that more in mm -hmm. detail later. Mm -hmm. No, well, let's, let's jump right into that, right? This, uh, how the uh, COVID has uh, impacted and changed the way we deal with dispute resolution, the processes that we're used to. Prior to COVID, um, I remember that in the 2019s and before that, Zoom, was something that not everyone would know about. <laughs> and very quickly, moving into the 2020, um, you find that people rapidly gain an understanding of uh, a Zoom and the other platforms, and they use them for not just meetings, but also for dispute resolution. So um, thinking a lot about what's happened in the last two years and how the dispute resolution processes has evolved moving into the virtual realm, do you find, and uh, you know, maybe for Julie first, that the uh, virtual environment, do you find that conducive to um, arbitration? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, with COVID, we have moved rapidly uh, to a complete remote environment. We have conducted entire proceeding remotely. And I think it's been uh, quite easy for arbitration practitioners because the tools were already there. Some aspects of arbitration were already done remotely, for instance, a case management conference, some procedural hearings, and even you know with witness examination when one witness could not attend a hearing for, for a reason or another. So we have been quick to adapt and there, there's been little disruption uh, in arbitration proceedings overall compared to state court proceedings, uh, some have faced like substantial uh, delay. And frankly, it, it worked fine. Mm. Uh, we have now uh, virtual uh, protocols for virtual hearings in place, which address you know, issues that were maybe not considered before, such as confidentiality online, a security of information online. Uh, and, um, and we have conducted several uh, virtually hearing absolutely fine. Uh, so I think th this is a good change. This is, I think, uh, going to stay, I mean, at least to some extent, and also because it's, it allows considerable, considerable savings in terms of uh, time and cost sometimes as well. And this is something the users of arbitration are, are really looking for. Uh, although we should not underestimate the cost of holding a virtual hearing, uh, there are important technical costs. We have also uh, to, to bear in mind that not everybody around the globe has access to the same technology. And I also think that certain aspects of arbitration are better, uh, you know, hold in person. Uh, I personally prefer to address the tribunal in person than virtually, although it works. Uh, I think uh, witness interview, witness examination, it be is better than in person because you, you can engage in a personal level, which can be extremely important in, in a resolution of the dispute. But um, remote hearings are here to stay, definitely. Thank you, Julie. And, and you know, that resonates with me. I remember when, um, 
remote hearings were first rolled out in Singapore for the courts. Um, a lot of lawyers were very concerned on how that would pan out, not being used to cross-examining, for example, witnesses through a little screen on your... You, you feel as though you cannot absorb the full spectrum of the conduct of the person when they're answering the question. And, and yet it's worked out quite well, I must say, and people are now very receptive to holding uh, trials and hearings uh, on Zoom and other platforms. But that brings me to the other topic which uh, is related to mediation, right Beatrice, that we often feel that in uh, mediation the body language is so important. Uh, being able to see the entire spectrum, not just what's physically the, what was said, but the tone, the tonality and the, the body, what the person reacts. Um, so same question about the virtual environment. Do you, do you think that the virtual environment has, is conducive to mediation or has, is there something lost when we move from physical to uh, uh, online for mediations? If you had asked me more than two years ago to do an online mediation, I would have said, no way, it can't be done, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I guess we've all learned throughout the years. I've done mediations with a uh, mix of hybrid and people in the room wearing masks and people dialed in from across the world. So it does work. We have all gotten used to it quite quickly. Um, it works well. Actually, I'm surprised how well it works. However, we have the technology issues that Julie also mentioned. Sometimes you lose things, you lose connection and so on. It is convenient. Yes, it's cheaper. You don't have to travel. So all that um, leads to uh, a thought that, yes, it will stay. However, as you mentioned, we rely so much on communication and communication goes so far beyond what is being said but the whole body language the whole facial expressions hands gestures this is all a thing that i feel is um, missing if you do an online mediation plus obviously confidentiality thoughts i mean you don't know who else is in the room you keep telling the parties oh it's confidential you're just talking to me now as a mediator but you don't really know what's being recorded who else is hiding in a corner behind your screen so i think we will gain more momentum with um, physical mediations again but yes for sure it's gonna stay as well to a certain extent Thank you. So all of us are, you know, champions for virtual online environment and I think that's probably true. It's all here to stay. Let's move on to a, something quite different. Um, when I was a younger lawyer, I remember that uh, one of the things uh, my partners would always ask us young lawyers to do is to, in every contract you drop, insert an ADR clause. In those days, inserting an ADR clause wasn't called ADR clause, it was called an arbitration clause. It would simply be an institutional clause that you plan in towards the end of the one of the boilerplates towards the end of the contract. Uh, today we've become very sophisticated because we recognize that um, you should offer people a, a spectrum of different ways to resolve disputes and increasingly we are beginning to see that those dispute resolution clauses take the form of a multi-tiered dispute resolution clause. So you know I want to ask Julie first, um, you know from your perspective do you find these kinds of multi-tiered dispute resolution clauses and for the benefit of um, audiences who are not particularly in, in the you know experience these clauses they would be clauses where the first port of reference if you encounter a dispute may be uh, to meet the other side in a mutual uh, negotiated environment and if that doesn't result in the closure of the dispute it might lead to an escalation to a, a mediated kind of process uh, with a neutral involved and if that doesn't resolve the matter then it might lead to a party which is going to be appointed as a neutral, either as a, a neutral evaluator or as an arbitrator. So it's tiered in that fashion so that you escalate it uh, in, 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 in progression. So Julie, do you find that in practice those kinds of uh, dispute resolution clauses are helpful to the client? Is it frequently used? Um, yeah, thank you, Tad. I think it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, we see those clauses more and more in international contracts. Uh, there can be many steps uh, in the dispute resolution process. Uh, mediation is often one of them, uh, and only if mediation fails, for instance, within 60 days, then only you can uh, move and introduce uh, your arbitration. Um, and I, I would say in principle, that's a good idea, yes, because uh, 
you know, I, I truly believe that settling the dispute outside of court of arbitration uh, is always in the interest of, of the client. Uh, and forcing Sparty to sit down and talk the dispute through uh, uh, is always a good idea and can be successful even when they don't think it, it could work. Now, that being said, I, I would like to, to make a few caveats uh, based on my own uh, experience and my own practice. Uh, I think it's not always helpful to have a mandatory mediation uh, before proceeding to, to arbitration because sometimes it gives rise to disputes uh, over whether mediation had, had been properly completed or attempted in good faith, or whether the dispute resolution clause had been properly implemented, uh, which is what I was referring to earlier, you know, which gives rise to disputes within the disputes, even when, you know, before uh, coming to the matter of the dispute. And that's really the worst case scenario. And it adds delays and obviously unnecessary costs to the whole process. Mm. Uh, and in fact, you know, a, a mediation doesn't have to be a mandatory mediation. You can, you can uh, uh, start a mediation at any point in time before the arbitration during the course of arbitration, there are certain steps during the process of arbitration, which are quite good moments to try to resolve the disputes so you can suspend your arbitration. So I think maybe instead of putting you know, mandatory clauses for, for mediation, which can be seen as, a, as a, you know, a waste of time for the parties who are not in the right mindset, uh, and can be even counterproductive. Maybe uh, a solution is to to mention, you know, mediation as a non-binding recommendation or reminder in the dispute resolution clause without making it a compulsory process. Mm -hmm. That that's so so useful, um, Julie. Your thoughts on this because I mean, um, so many times I think a lot of us who do this kind of work encounter mediation where parties are not ready or not willing at that point in time to mediate and. When they come into the forum, sometimes what they will, the lawyers will tell you, quite frankly, is that they need to go past this stage yes. before they reach their true end goal process, which is um, uh, usually arbitration, right? So, but you know, on that point, um, Beatrice, um, what's your view on this? Yeah, I, I guess I see it a little bit differently. Also, I agree with a lot of things that Julie said. I, I think, I mean, I always recommend to put a mediation clause in the contracts. And um, we also have in Switzerland and in Singapore, we have these model clauses that already include mediation and then arbitration after 60 days or so. And I think it's great. Why would I say that? Because I think it takes the dispute out of the dispute. You don't have to have the discussion again about having a mediation or not. And you can break it off after half an hour right if you realize no that's not for us you don't have to go through a long process in mediation and the other thing i think it prevents which i said previously in my in my slides as well is there is a certain fear of appearing weak if you suggest mediation there is a certain fear of um oh but what's my role and i'm i'm the lawyer here i don't want to recommend mediation so you take that away with a clause because you preempt it it's just one step in the proceedings so this makes it just a bit more accessible a bit more um or a bit less of a dispute whether you want to have it or not and i really feel that it's a very important step even if you don't extend it for too long and the end is arbitration mm. yeah that, that's that's actually all true as well you know the literature shows that even for mandatory mediations, court-directed mediations, you find that you would have thought that maybe because people are forced into that process that the outcomes are going to be way lower in terms of successful or mediated settlements compared to those where uh, people are entirely voluntary to, to go into the process. But some of the literature that I've read coming out from the States uh, reveal that it's actually not very far off that even for mandatory mediations, uh, people do end up um, often at the same point uh, of closure as they might have been further down the road um, and it's fully voluntary. But that does bring us to a, a good point uh, where we want to introduce the question of uh, what if um, it is institutionalized, right, by way of some kind of procedure, for example, like a, an up meet up procedure, right? And we all know that um, in Singapore, um, SIAC uh, was in the earlier days um, 
champion this as a, a good marrying up of the two dispute resolution processes. Start your arbitration first and then along the way segue into mediation and if you settle the case, come back and record the mediated outcome, the settlement as a by consent arbitral award. So, you know, want to ask uh, maybe Julie first and, and Beatrice, um, do you think that this kind of procedure, like an up meet up procedure, which can result in a settlement taking the form of an enforceable consent award, is that a, a good practical and useful middle ground between uh, arbitration and mediation? Uh, thank you, Tat. Uh, I think it may indeed be a good hybrid mechanisms with, which brings out the benefits of, of both mediation and arbitration. And I think it, it has parallel with the uh, settlement facilitation uh, process I was mentioning earlier, where you first initiate arbitration, but then you pause, have this hearing to, uh, to discuss uh, preliminary views on the case. And here, how does this ARMEDAR protocol works in practice, basically, uh, the, the tribunal, so arbitration is initiated and the tribunal stays the arbitration after the exchange of uh, the notice of arbitration and the response to the notice of arbitration. They refer uh, the parties to mediation, uh, to, to a mediation, mediator, which is different from, from the arbitrators in this case. And, and you would have a certain duration to, to do that mediation. Typically, I think it would be capped to to eight weeks, and if the parties do not settle the dispute within that period, then arbitration continues or is resumed. Uh, but if they do uh, settle, then their agreement is recording, as you were saying, by the, the, the tribunal in the form of a consent award. Um, and that consent award has the effect of a standard arbitral award that is legally binding and enforceable and I think that's a huge benefit, uh, which is usually not available in, in a typical uh, mediation. And that would be, in my view, uh, the biggest advantage of, of that process. Uh, yeah, the, the, in that scenario, the parties who sex successfully mediate can obtain a binding and enforceable conclusion of their dispute. Mm. Thank you, Julianne. Over to you, Beatrice. What do you think? I mean, there are some who would say, well, you know, with the advent of the Singapore Convention on Mediation, well, you know, the protocol has uh, probably seen better days and, you know, it's time to let mediation result in a mediated settlement agreement rather than it be converted to uh, uh, an arbitral award. What, what's your view on this? Well, I think where we stand today with the arbitral award, this is still um, the impossibility is a good point, right? What truly said about the um, agreements then. I think with mediation, it's a contract. You can write um, in the contract whatever you want. So this is a benefit if you just, just have a settlement. Um, you can cover things that might not hold um, in an arbitrational uh, award. But I guess what you want to do is really... Um, you want to have the option, right? It really depends. I think it's a good setting, but as soon as you are forced to go for arbitration again, you might not need that. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit biased. Let's see where we go. But as long as we don't have signed the Singapore Convention in Switzerland, I guess um, we are happy to uh, to have that uh, med or option as well. Thank but you. if I may, interestingly, I have hardly ever seen it used in practice. Yeah. You'd say oh, so okay. it, it sounds like a, a, a great idea and a great protocol but hardly put in arbitration clause uh so i don't know about your experience that but yeah uh, well I, I i've heard that um uh, in the at least in the singapore context sometimes it can be difficult to um encourage uh, uh, the appointment of an arbitrator uh, for a case where parties are using that protocol to go into mediation uh, because arbitrators would like to, you know, to be appointed for the purpose of being an arbitrator and not just to allow the case to segue uh, to mediation and then eventually record a consent uh, uh, award. But I think this is an evolving state. I think we're still in a case of evolution where now people see multiple streams, right? Um, really back to the days where it's a uh, multi-corridor as, as what uh, Professor Sanders was uh, first rolled out in, in the States. And truly, there are now many streams of 
dispute resolution processes that allows people to resolve their disputes. And really, this is a theme for today, isn't it? That we're inviting participants to come and think about, apart from going to court when you have a commercial dispute uh, or civil dispute, um, think about um, using the process of arbitration and about using the process of mediation. Uh, our knowledgeable speakers, Beatrice and Julie, have all have explained the, the pros of both processes and in some respect, how different the processes are. Um, we've kind of reached a, a good point in our timing at 6 p.m. where we want to wrap up, uh, you know, last questions, last opportunity to ask questions or comments, but if not, um, what we're going to do is to wrap up today's program and move into a, a, a little networking session with everyone. Um, so I don't see anything in the chat group, so it would just leave me, I think, to thank both Beatrice and Julie for committing your time and sharing with us you know, all the knowledge and experience that you've had. Uh, I'm sure all the participants who've attended today, as well as the uh, participants who will join us subsequently in YouTube would find this very beneficial. Also want to thank Ambassador for joining us today and um, encouraging us with um, the developments uh, uh, in progress of what's happening in Switzerland and how that uh, ties in with what's happening here in this part of the world as well. So on that note, um, I'm going to hand this back to uh, Swiss Chamber. Thank you for organizing this.